Wildfire Podcast is an extension of Wildfire, which has a focus of igniting men and women of God into a deeper discipleship with Christ, instilling people with a passion to radically and relentlessly pursue Christ wherever that leads, that God's truth will spread like a wildfire. Mate, you just missed the most intense round of my life. Like, I, Marty fell, and then I came and threw a shell at him and flipped him over, and then Baby Princess Peach overtook me. She had a boost, but I had a green shell in my back pocket, and literally the line's like right there. I chucked it, and she like does a flip over me as I fly in for first! Yes! Hi everyone, so welcome back to another Candid Conversation. I am joined once more by Mr. Mark Crooks. Once again. What an absolute privilege. Mm-hmm. This is uh, twice now. I How do you feel about that? <laughs> I think I'm losing my voice. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's great. It's good to have conversations. It's just to learn from each other. Eh? Yeah. So the conversation <laughs> that I want to talk you know, candidly and openly about um, is not every religion can be right, question mark. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You mean? Yeah. Is it, is it, that's, not, that's not a statement. Not every religion can be yeah. right. That's yeah. a question mark that we're going to discuss. Mm-hmm. Okay? And then we'll form our statements and our conclusions at the end. But the first thing I were to, uh, I want to jump in and, and give an initial framework, which I've talked to you about. And yeah. I can hear your sort of initial thoughts on that. Is whenever we come to any sort of religion, uh, the framework that we should apply is origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And all of these things must have consistency and coherency. So what's the origin of the religion, the meaning of the, of the religion, the morality of the religion, and the destiny of the religion? And do those things consistently and coherently work together? And so if you apply that to Judaism, to Islam, to Buddhism, to Hinduism, to Christianity, and uh, you apply that same framework and you look at the origin, you look at the meaning, etc. And those consistently and coherently apply, you will find which one that is, okay? Mm-hmm. Spoilers, Christianity, okay? So that's the initial framework that we're going to lead with. Um, so everyone has a what they believe and why they believe it. What do you think on that? I think today a lot of people search for, hey, your truth, let it be your truth. My truth, it'll be my truth. Right, and truth has lost the sense of absolute, and it's become a more positive framework of opinion, experience, background, culture, diversity, and it's how you view it. And when it comes to religion, it has become, it hasn't it become an absolute. And I think it's it's strange to look at a world and the world we live in today for dealing with how many centuries, the percentage of this world that do believe in a higher power, whatever the religion is, um, compared to the percentage of people that don't. And I think even just looking at that perspective challenges you to think, is there something bigger than me, right? Um, And therefore, when we're talking about religion, you can't just say, well, let your truth be your truth, because it's more profound than that. It's deeper than that, and it carries a lot more weight. So there is a question of absolute truth. Mm. So the question is, what is the absolute truth? Yeah. Regardless of our opinion of it. Yeah, exactly. And everyone has what they believe. There's not a single person that doesn't from the youngest age to the oldest age. You've got what you believe, but you've also got the why you believe it. And so the what is simply what you're standing on. Mm -hmm. And the why is how credible is the thing that you're standing on. And so uh, if you say what I believe is Islam, okay, that's what you're standing on. Let's see how sure that foundation actually is. And we talked about the framework that you can use to see whether that is true or not. And I think that is important whenever you come to these conversations. You want to take each religion in and of itself and the what that people believe. And you don't need to focus on the what so much. It's the why. What is it that you're standing on? And why is that strong or why is that weak? So, thirdly, is truth exclusive or is truth 
inclusive. So you sort of already talked about that, this idea of mm-hmm. absolute truth, etc. Mm-hmm. But many people do say that truth is not objective, it's subjective. Mm-hmm. But do you think, and, and thus it's then inclusive, everyone can be involved regardless. Yeah. Islam, Christianity, it's, a, it's all truth. If it's your truth, it's all truth. It's all subjective <coughs> and inclusive. Or is truth exclusive in the sense that there is an objective truth that simply isolates mm-hmm. certain thoughts, certain truths that people proclaim? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't have that. <clears throat> take, the, take the example of a courtroom. We had a justice system that was based on a truth that stood on opinions, mm-hmm. experience, the movement of justice, right? Because therefore, anyone that stands on the truth, because it's their truth. And truth needs to stand firm and separate from the experience, from the emotion, from the, from the background, <clears throat> because it needs to stand alone. Because quite often we think, that we hold truth up, right? But the reality is we need a sound of truth. I don't know if that imagery makes sense, but it's the idea of truth should remain. Sticking with the core of monology, it's it carries our justice, just the just the, how the importance of having an absolute truth. Because it shapes and constructs the society we live in. How we interact with people and how we engage with people. Unfortunately, we take things of differences and put up defenses and opposition and we create ourselves enemies and whatever structure you want to look at, whether it's politics or economics or or tribalism or nationalism. But the reality is we need to learn how to engage with differences and still remain open to understanding. And I think when it comes to religion, it's not the response of that's wrong, ignore, it's don't defend, it's to explore, to understand that we're actually all humans trying to get through life, make the most of it. And that's why it's important to wrestle with this thing called the truth and not be complacent and, un- and passive mm-hmm. on <clears throat> what gets you through the day because that's all the truth is seeking for. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And. It's this idea that, say for example, I'm human and I say that I think humans need oxygen to survive. And then you come up and say, I think humans don't need oxygen to survive. Mm-hmm. Truth is objective and it is exclusive. That is to say that it'll exclude your thought and it will include my thought. Mm-hmm. Okay? Truth just doesn't come along and say, yeah, you're right and you're right. Mm-hmm. That just changes the whole nature of truth. So there is this idea of an absolute truth. And the Bible says that that truth is a person and that person is Jesus. Yeah. So, again, following up on that, uh, question four is, do major religions affirm that they can all be true? Like, does Islam say, yeah, Christianity can be true, and Judaism says that Christianity can be, can, can be true, Hinduism says Buddhism can be true, Buddhism says Islam can be true. Do all the religions each say that truth is inclusive, or do the religions themselves say, <laughs> no, we are true in and of ourselves and all these other ones can't be true. I think the commonalities within religion do reveal to us of a common truth, right? The fact all of these religions seek the idea of a higher power, um, seeking the idea that there is an afterlife, that there's, there's a purpose and meaning to this life, that we are created for a reason, mm-hmm. right? Seeing those commonalities and drawing them up, you kind of think, okay, there's something they're pointing to. Right, um, looking at religions of the East, beautiful religions that practice discipline and trying to better oneself to then gain an entrance into into a paradise. It's a beautiful philosophy and beautiful way of living. You look at the Abrahamic religions, including Christianity, Judaism, and and Islam, stemming in the West and rooted deep in the Old Testament. It is looking at the idea of how. They journey with being created by God and then seeking a relationship with God, but then how do they gain access to God and how to gain access to that paradise? But in looking at all of this, it just raises the question, what's God to me? Or who am I to God? That's when Christianity, in my opinion, takes a turn because for the first time, 
I'm not loved based on what I do. I'm loved based on who's loving me. Mm. I'm not about, it's not about me at all. It's the first time God steps into humanity. Um, John 1, 14, the word became flesh. Like God, creator of the universe, put on skin and bone and dwelled among his people, moved into the neighborhood to be with us. It's nearly the point, hitting home the point that we couldn't get to God, so God came to us. Yeah. So the commonality, there must be a higher power. There must be a meaning and a purpose yeah. to this life. But the separation is that God came to us, not that we have to seek God. Yeah, so you're saying that each religion has facets of truth, but not the totality. <clears throat> Whereas Christianity, that is the absolute and objective, exclusive truth that by definition excludes these mm -hmm. other religions in the sense of what they mm -hmm. propagate negatively. Mm -hmm. And those other religions that are wrong have elements of truth within them that point towards this absolute truth that is God. God incarnate who came to man, mm -hmm. not man who had to go to God. Yeah. And again, <clears throat> uh, all religions just simply can't be true because if you look at Buddhism, they have no God. Hinduism, they have many gods. Judaism has Yahweh. Islam has Allah and Christianity has the Trinity mm -hmm. with reference to salvation. Buddhism has enlightenment. Hinduism has reincarnation. Judaism has the law. Islam has the five pillars. And Christianity has grace. And then there is Buddhism. They believe in the true way. Hinduism think that all are true. Judaism thinks that just Judaism is true. Islam thinks that just Islam is true. And Christianity thinks that just Christianity is true. So is all religions right? The answer <laughs> is fundamentally no. And that coincides with this idea that truth is exclusive. Mm -hmm. So then finally, how do we discern what is true and what is not? So knowing that there is this absolute truth and knowing that all religions cannot be true, mm -hmm. how do we know that they are true? And I've already mentioned the framework of origin, meaning, morality and destiny as the starting point and now I'm bringing this back what do you think are other tools that can help us understand what religion is right and what religion is not I know that there's different epistemological views philosophy mm -hmm. history science experience they can all attest yeah. to what is the one truth but do you have mm -hmm. any thoughts on that? Um, I think there's two ways you can look at it take for example if you want to look at the bible See the history and the credibility of your source. And again, that's stepping on the toes of origin, right? But I think another helpful f framework would be to talk to people who know the religion, right? If I want to know more about Islam, I can do my own research, yes. But I could also ask someone practicing the Islamic faith, why do you believe what you believe? Hopefully in turn, they ask me why I believe what I believe. And you remove the barriers of opposing sides and rather we are two humans trying to get through life believing there's purpose and meaning and we're seeking truth whether they even if they don't believe in religion or a higher power it's a question of well why and having that mindset of exploring and learning in the content of what they believe and from their understanding their experiences and their teaching it's nearly treating people as an expert in their field Right, and an expert to how they came to the conclusion and having the mindset of exploring allows you to be discernment in terms of what's been consistent here challenging each other challenging yourself because ultimately truth stands I'll give another example in Acts when the apostles are brought in and I think it's Peter and uh, the Sanhedrin like are ridiculing them saying you can't preach this message right and forgive me for forgetting his name, but one of the elders of the Sanhedrin court stands up and gives a testament of how we have seen false teachings before. And those men have died horrible deaths and, they, like, and their teaching never lasted. So be careful, and he said this to the council, be careful when you're challenging these men because let, let them go, because if it's true, then you're fighting God, right? And if it's not, they'll fall away. Because ultimately God's word will last. I think that's also a testament mm. to what is truth. Yeah. 
truth is something that la is lasting and remains and stands the test of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just practically on the ground, uh, people are like, how, how can we do this then? Knowing that there is this exclusive <laughs> absolute truth, knowing that there is this framework, knowing that all religions can't be true, how then do I apply this whenever we look at Islam or we look at Hinduism or Buddhism? And I've plucked, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses, that's this, mm -hmm. this, this, this religion. Uh, what do they believe and why do they believe? So what's the credibility? Of what they're standing on and mm -hmm. you can just pluck one aspect of that is they believe that there is one God Jehovah they believe that Jesus is a God the Bible says that there is one God so now you have two gods how do you resolve that so just within four questions Jehovah's Witnesses have apparent contradiction where they've got two gods and the Bible that they believe in says that there is one God so that's an apparent contradiction mm -hmm. that is resolved in the Trinity for example so I want to just leave with a parable yeah so get ready and the purpose of the parable is uh, to be thought-provoking to be challenging you may not get it at first but it's something that you can rewatch it go back think and meditate on and then the explanation that's going to be released later so it is this there was a man who desired to reach the destination that was called truth he stood by one of the many rivers that he thought could get him there. One day, he decided to jump into one of these rivers and travel down the perceived river that would lead him to truth. However, when he explored further, the riverbed began to produce holes and the water levels began to dissipate. Soon, the river was dry and the man who thought he was on the right journey to truth was now left in a state of asphyxiation, helplessness and confusion. This cycle would be repeated. Despite his efforts, he could not attain the right way that would lead him to the place that was called truth. He gave up all hope. One day, while the man was sorrowful, a light illuminated another river. So the man picked himself up and began another journey towards truth. This time the riverbank was firm and impenetrable and the river flow remained. Finally, the man had reached the place that was called truth. So that ends us for this kind of conversation and we will see you on the next one.